Hi all, I hope everything is going well for you. This lecture covers chapters 10 and 11. So now we will shift our focus from economic fluctuations and determination of output in the short and medium runs to growth and determination of output in the long run. Remember that from now onwards, whenever we talk about economic growth, we are not referring to growth of output itself, but growth rate of output per worker, growth rate of output per person, or growth rate of output per capita, which is measured using growth of GDP per capita. Also remember that we use GDP per capita to measure standard of living within a country over time or between countries. So in the beginning of this lecture, we will discuss some facts on growth and the evolution of economic growth. Then we will introduce an aggregate production function. We will discuss the impact of capital on output and the impact of output on capital accumulation. And then we will infer the impact of savings on growth rate and consumption on growth rate. Also, this lecture is going to have a lot of math, especially a lot of algebra, so brace yourselves. This chapter will help you understand and answer questions like, why do you think the standard of living of the average person has increased over the past 200 years, or more so in the past 60 or so years? We will also try to answer questions like, what do you think determines the natural level of output in the long run? When you use equipment or machinery as a part of your job, does it always remain productive? What is the link between saving and long run output? So to begin this lecture, we will talk about a few facts on growth and the evolution of economic growth over time. The first three sections of chapter 10 in your textbook go into detail about the facts about growth. It's mostly history and statistics on the process of economic growth. You should read them and be familiar with them. We are more interested in explaining the following. So how did humanity escape the Malthusian trap? The concept of what is known as the Malthusian trap was first proposed by Thomas Robert Malthus in 1798. While living in 19th century England, Malthus witnessed the decline of standard of living as birth rates rose among the poor. The Malthus also observed that output per person had an equilibrium level, and any increase in output per person from that equilibrium level would, in, would lead to an increase in population so that the output per person was again back to its equilibrium value. Why? because that extra increase in output was taken up or divided up amongst the increase in population. The Malthusian trap argues that as population increases, the world would not be able to sustain crop production to feed the ever-growing population. And also elaborated that populations grow in a way such that it overtakes the development of adequate land for crops. The Malthusian trap also states that output gains per person through advancing technologies are lost through increased growth in population. The Malthusian trap or Malthusian stagnation, which is basically the stagnation of output per person or equal to zero growth rates, lasted from the end of the Roman Empire to around the year 1500. After the year 1500, the growth rate was positive, but still very small. For much of human history, growth, growth rates were close to zero, but began to increase sharply in a sustained manner only after the Industrial Revolution, whereby production transitioned into using new manufacturing processes, going from using handmade production methods to machines using steam power, water power, etc. Between 1820 and 1950, US growth was around 1.5% per year. Sustained growth has been high since 1950. There has been a large increase in output per person, particularly due to the force of compounding. 
which means that a higher output will be followed by another high output the next year because you already have a base of machinery and equipment to increase output the next year and hence growth rates keep increasing. Post-war eras like after the 1940s are also often associated with high growth rates because of a sudden increase in aggregate demand and production in an economy. Second interesting aspect of growth theory is the convergence of output per person across all countries over time. Convergence in growth theory argues that as countries develop and growth rates increase, countries both rich and poor tend to converge in terms of output per person. The simple idea is that poor countries are going to grow faster than richer countries and eventually catch up to them. It hasn't caught up everywhere, but there is a very obvious convergence to some set level of output per person. For OECD countries, there is clear evidence of convergence. Convergence is also visible for many Asian countries, especially for those with high growth rates, for example, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong. However, most African countries were very poor in 1960, and some of them even had negative rates of growth between 1960 and 2011, partly due to internal or external conflicts. As we discussed before, there was a large increase in standard of living worldwide since 1950. Another important concept or term that you should remember is leapfrogging. Leapfrogging is the notion that less developed countries which have poorly developed economic bases, low output and poor technology, these countries can move themselves forward rapidly through the adoption of modern systems without going through intermediary steps. In chapter 6, we had a production function that was simply a constant returns to scale function of labor supply. So our production function only had labor supply. But that wasn't very realistic, was it? So now we add capital K to the production process. So your output is a function of capital and the labor used in production. This K includes all physical capital used in production. Think of K as a sum of all the machines, equipments, plants, and office buildings in the economy. Any tool or any facility used in the production process will be included in K, physical capital. This is what we call the aggregate production function because it maps aggregate measures of labor and aggregate measures of capital into aggregate real output. Recall that in chapter 6, we had assumed a constant returns to scale for our production function. We will continue that assumption in this chapter for this production function as well. Constant returns to scale means that an increase in input will be translated into an equal increase in output. For this production function, this means, or a constant returns to scale means, that if you increase both inputs, capital and labor, by two units, your output will also increase by two units. More generally, if you increase production by any real number, x, so if you increase production, if you increase inputs by x, your output will also increase by x. So in order for the constant returns to scale assumption to hold for both inputs, it must be the case that we have decreasing returns to scale in each of the individual inputs. This means that if you only increase one input, say you only increase capital, output will still increase, but it won't increase at the same rate. It will increase at a decreasing rate. So say you keep labor unchanged, labor input unchanged, and you increase capital by two units. 
your output will still increase but at a decreasing rate so say that your output only increases by one unit this this is what we mean by having decreasing returns to scale in each of, each of the individual inputs therefore holding labor constant an increase in capital leads to less and less of an increase in output this is also the case when capital is held constant and labor is increased. In terms of derivatives, this means that the second partial derivatives of the production function fkk and fnn are always less than zero. Intuitively, as I said before, this just states that holding labor constant, an increase in capital will increase output, but at a smaller and smaller rate, the more capital you add. Similarly, holding capital constant, each additional worker we add may increase output, but that increase is getting smaller and smaller the more workers we add. Because we have assumed constant returns to scale, we can also see a simple relation between output per worker and capital per worker. So basically, you have to divide your production function by n, your labor supply, and you can get this following relationship between output per worker and capital per worker. The decreasing returns to scale of capital remains unchanged even with this manipulation. So output over n equal to function of capital over n comma 1. This figure graphs the production function and shows the simple relationship between output per worker and capital per worker using the production function. The fact that the production function has decreasing returns to scale in each individual input can be seen through this graph. So say we increase capital work per worker from A to B, and we see that output increases by, say, an equal amount. But as we keep adding more capital to the production process, we will see that the increase in output per worker keeps on decreasing. Note that we are holding labor constant here. So an increase in capital per worker from B to C is only increasing output per worker by a less amount than the increase in capital per worker. Again, an increase in capital per worker from C to D only increases output per worker by this small amount from C prime to D prime. There are two sources of growth in terms of output per person. The first is capital accumulation, and the second is technological progress. This lecture focuses on the effects of capital accumulation. Now notice your production function here. Your production function output per worker is equal to your production function between units k over n and a constant. So this production function y over n is a function of k over n or capital per worker. So we can write y over n as a function of capital per worker. So for convenience, we will write the production function as this equation. This uppercase f represents the production function. This lowercase f just says that your y over n is a function of your capital per worker. So for this production function, we assume that the size of the population, the participation rate, and the unemployment rate are all constant. This implies that n is held constant. Again, 
there is no technological progress or that the form of f stays constant over time. Since n is held constant, only capital and output need time subscripts. Recall that this is the substitution that we made here. So the equation in the previous slide means that output per worker measured by GDP per capita at any point in time is a function of capital stock per worker at that time. This means that output per capita at time t depends on capital stock per worker at time t. To derive the relationship between output and capital, we will return to the goods market model. Equilibrium in the goods market can be stated as investment equals savings plus taxes minus government spending. For now, we will assume that taxes are equal to government spending, so we are only left with investment equals savings for the equilibrium in the goods market. Furthermore, we will also assume that savings is a fixed proportion S of income or output. Since our equilibrium in the goods market is investment equals savings, we can plug in this expression into that equilibrium and get this equation after adding time subscripts. So here we can say that investment at time t is a fixed proportion S of income at time t. Now we will look at how capital is accumulated over time and explain the accumulation using an equation. So think about all the physical capital used in production. As you use more and more of capital in production, they experience wear and tear. That is the value of existing capital decreases over time. That is why it is important to include a depreciation term in your capital accumulation equation. This depreciation rate is the rate at which capital is worn out or exhausted due to its use in production. This depreciation rate will be included in our equation for capital accumulation and we will call this depreciation rate delta. In addition, there will be investment into new capital and we will denote that as IT for investment Therefore, capital at time t plus 1 is equal to capital at time t minus all the capital that depreciated at time t plus new investment into capital. We can simply pull out the capital t, capital at time t, and get this term to get this equation for capital accumulation. Therefore, this equation says that capital next period is equals the capital left over after depreciation and after investment is added to it. Recall the investment equation that we just found. We can plug that equation into our capital equa equation and then divide by n the number of workers in the economy to get this equation. Finally, we can multiply through the 1 minus delta times kt over n to get this equation. So kt over n times 1, and then we bring that to the left side, and then kt over n times delta, and we keep it in the right side, and we get this equation. This equation says, that the growth of capital stock, which is represented by the term at the left, is equal to your income saved minus the depreciated capital in terms of per worker.
Recall this equation from the aggregate production function slide. We can basically replace yt over n into this equation with function of kt over n and then derive this equation. Given this equation and the output per worker equation, we are ready to examine the dynamics of output and capital. So recall how we found out steady state for variable x. So when you're trying to find out steady state for variable x, you're going to say that x at time t, x at time t plus 1, or x at any time period is equals to x star. That is, your variable x is not growing. So if you want to do the same for steady state capital, you have to assume that capital does not grow over time. So capital at time t, capital at time t plus 1, capital at time t minus 1, capital at t plus 2, all will be equal to k star. And the steady state capital, the value of the steady state capital, will depend on the savings rate and the depreciation rate. But why does the steady state capital depend on savings and depreciation rate? Think about the capital accumulation equation in the last slide. At the steady state, the capital stock per worker is not growing at all. So think about the left side of the capital accumulation equation, where you have kt plus 1 over n minus kt over n. At the steady state, this kt plus 1 is equals k star, and this kt at steady state is also k star. Hence, the left side of that capital accumulation equation is equal to zero. Therefore, at the steady state, the left side of the capital accumulation equation we saw in the last slide is equal to zero, and our capital accumulation equation at the steady state becomes this equation. Notice how the steady state capital depends on savings and depreciation rate. Again, notice what this term looks like. This term looks like y over n equals function of k over n. That is our relationship between output per worker and capital per worker. So at the steady state, this output per worker becomes y star over n. And this entire term, s times the function, becomes s times y star over n. And this s times y star over n is actually your investment in the steady state, investment per worker in the steady state, because investment is equals s times income. We will use this relationship in the next slide. But now look at this equation. So this left side of the capital accumulation equation is basically your investment per worker. And the right side of this capital accumulation equation is the depreciation incurred on current capital in the steady state. The easiest way to understand the dynamics of output and capital is to graph them together. So this equation is your output per worker equation. So function of k t over n, this is your production function. Since your investment per worker is a proportion s of your production function, your investment per worker curve will be below your output per worker curve. And then you have another straight line for the depreciation per worker, which is a fixed proportion depreciation rate delta times kt over n. Once you drew all these three curves, you can see that the steady state occurs where this term is equals your depreciation term so the steady state will be at the point when your depreciation per worker line intersects your investment per worker line at this point.
So your steady state capital is equals k star over n. Steady state capital per worker is equals k star over n. And steady state cap output per worker is equals y star over n. The arrows on the horizontal axis represent the direction the capital stock is heading around the steady state value. Remember that the growth of capital in an economy will depend on the amount of capital that is being depreciated every year and the amount of capital that is being invested into the economy. Okay, so when the current capital stock is greater than its steady state value, so this is your steady state value of capital. So if the current capital stock is greater than, okay, so if the current capital stock is greater than its steady state value at this level, depreciation here at this point look at the depreciation curve is greater than investment of capital and as a result your growth rate of capital must be negative because more is being depreciation depreciated at this point than is being invested conversely when capital per worker is less than the steady state value so say at this point Okay, uh, this point, when capital per worker is less than the steady state value, investment at this point is greater than the capital stock, greater than the depreciation of capital stock. Since investment of capital stock is greater than depreciation of capital stock, capital stock must be growing. Therefore, we can use this graph to explain what is happening to the growth of capital stock if, if your current capital stock is greater than the steady state value or less than the steady state value. There are three things to observe about the effect of savings on the growth rate. First, the savings rate has no impact on the long-run growth rate of output per worker. Second, the savings rate does impact the level of output per worker in the long run. Third, a higher savings rate will lead to a higher growth of output per worker in the short run only, but not in the long run. The intuition for the first item is pretty straightforward. If the dynamics of capital accumulation pushes to the steady state, meaning that capital per worker at the steady state is not growing, which leads to output per worker in the steady state not growing, then obviously it doesn't matter what the savings rate is for the growth rate of output per worker in the long run, because in the long run at the steady state, output per worker is not growing anyways. To see why the second and third items are true, consider the above graph. If the savings rate increases, then your investment per worker curve shifts upwards. This implies that your steady state capital increases from this level to this level. And in the short run, this leads to growing output. But this growing output only continues in the short run till capital per worker reaches its new steady state level at K1 over N level. Once the capital stock reaches its steady state levels in the long run, then the growth rate of output per worker will stop again. So what do agents in this economy do with what they don't save? Obviously, they consume it. Therefore, we can make a couple of inferences about savings rate and consumption. First, an economy in which savings rate has always been zero is an economy where capital is equal to zero. 
This is because we assume that savings lead to investment in capital. So if savings has always been equal to zero, capital is going to be equal to zero. And if capital is equal to zero, there is no output being produced because you have no capital. If output is equal to zero, or if income is equal to zero, then consumption is also going to be equal to zero. Second, an economy in which the savings rate is equal to one implies people choose not to consume any of their income. This economy has such a high steady state value of output that it requires saving everything to maintain that high steady state value of output. Therefore, the savings rate must be some value between zero and one that will maximize steady state consumption. For the rest of our analysis, we will assume a specific form of our production function, where y is equals a times square root of k times square root of n. This is the same as saying y is equals a times k to the power half times n to the power half. Here, a represents the technological capabilities of the economy. This particular type of production function is also known as the Cobb-Douglas production function. We will further simplify this production function by assuming that a is equals 1 and then we will get this production function in terms of per worker so we will divide both sides by n Once we get both sides by n, we will add time subscripts to y and k because we assume that labor supply is constant at n, so we don't add a time subscript to n. And so we know that yt over n can be written as function of kt over n. And on the right side, when we multiply, when we divide by n, we get this term. Once we have simplified the production function to this equation, we can insert this fkt over n into our accumulation of capital equation and then derive this equation for accumulation of capital. Recall that your steady state occurs where investment is equals depreciation and we know that our functional form of output is equals this which makes our investment equals depreciation equation in the steady state in this model equals to this equation. To find the steady state level of capital per worker, we have to solve for k star over n. So to do that, we will use this equation first and square on both sides to get this equation. After squaring both sides of that equation, you will end up with this equation. And then you can divide both sides of this equation by k star over n and then again divide both sides by delta square to get this particular equation for k star over n. This particular level is also called the golden rule capital stock per worker. Once you have the steady state value for the capital per worker, you can plug that in into this equation for the steady state value and then solve for y star over n to find the steady state value of output per worker. Steady state output per worker is equal to the ratio of savings rate to the depreciation rate. So steady state value of output per worker depends on the savings rate and the depreciation rate. Now let's look at the dynamic effects of an increase in the savings rate using a numerical example.
Suppose that we are currently in the steady state in year 0 and that the depreciation rate is 10% and the savings rate is also 10%. And in year 1, the savings rate increases from 10% to 20%. What are the dynamic effects of this increase? We know that in year 0, the capital per worker will be equal to its steady state value, which is S over delta whole square. Therefore, we can find the steady state value of capital per worker in year 0 to be equal to 1. And then we can use the capital accumulation equation that looks like this one to find the capital per worker value in period 1, which gives us K1 equals to 1.1. We can repeat the same steps and solve for K2 over N and so on. This graph here shows the dynamic effects of an increase in the savings rate on the level of output per worker. And as you can see, as we move along time, your level of output per worker also increases due to, a, due to an increase in the savings rate. However, let's look at the dynamic effects of an increase in the savings rate on output growth. So we can, as we can see that as time increases, as we move along time, the growth rate of output per worker is actually falling and it is approaching zero. This is because as we know that the savings rate only impacts output growth in the short run. But as we approach the longer run, the effect of savings rate on growth on output growth diminishes and becomes zero eventually. So why do we want higher levels of output anyways? We want higher levels of output because we want to be able to consume more in the future. And as a result, we're interested in finding that savings rate which will maximize steady state consumption. So we know that consumption is output minus savings. And we also know that in the steady state, savings is equals depreciation. So this is basically your output per worker minus savings per worker, which is equals to depreciation. So your consumption per worker is equals to Y star over N minus your depreciation at the steady state. You can plug in for the values of steady state output per worker and steady state capital per worker to eventually solve for the steady state consumption per worker equal to this equation. So now that we have a function for steady state consumption per worker that depends on the savings rate, we can use that equation to find the savings rate that maximizes steady state consumption per worker. And there are two ways you can do that. You can do it by calculating steady state consumption for a variety of savings rates, which would be very cumbersome. Or we could take a derivative of consumption per worker with respect to savings rate and then set that equals zero to find the maximum consumption per worker. For the first method, you can find out different levels of consumption per worker at the steady state by plugging in different values for the savings rate given a particular level of depreciation rate. But this is quite cumbersome and it takes a lot of time. Using calculus, we can actually get a more precise answer. We can take the derivative of consumption per worker at the steady state with respect to savings rate and the equation we would get would be set equals zero 
And then once that set equals zero, that would give us this particular equation where we can solve for s and find out that the savings rate is equals half or 50%. So 50% is the savings rate that would maximize consumption in the steady state or consumption per worker in the steady state. This is a result of the parameterization of the production function itself. A different Cobb-Douglas production function would actually give us a different savings rate. It will depend on the relative shares of capital and labor. Now let's consider our more general Cobb-Douglas production function. In this particular production function, this alpha here is known as the relative share of capital and the 1 minus alpha term here is known as the relative share of labor. Dividing both sides by n, we can get this following equation for the output per worker. Again, by using this equation and inserting it into the equation for capital accumulation, we can get the capital accumulation equation for this particular production function. We can get all the k star over n's on the left side and then delta and s on the right side and then solve for k star over n to get the capital per worker in the steady state. Raising both sides of the last equation on the last slide to the 1 over 1 minus alpha power gives us the steady state capital per worker equal to this equation. Now that we know our steady state output per worker and steady state capital per worker, we can solve for consumption per worker at the steady state using this equation, which is equals to this. And then you could simplify your consumption per worker at the steady state to this equation. Given values of alpha and delta, you could insert different values of the savings rate to find the savings rate that maximizes consumption. Or you could take the derivative of C star over N with respect to your savings rate. You can set that equals zero and then solve for S to find the steady state level of savings rate. Finally, when we solve for S, we arrive at savings rate equals to alpha, which is the relative share of capital. What we have found here is the golden rule savings rate. So your golden rule savings rate is equals alpha. And this is the savings rate alpha that maximizes consumption in the steady state. To understand from an intuitive perspective why S equals the capital share maximizes consumption, you need to think about income earned from capital. In a competitive equilibrium, the rental rate of capital is equal to its marginal product. The marginal product of capital is the output produced by adding one more unit of capital. Now think about the production function. And then let's divide the production function by n. Once you divide the production function by n, you end up with this equation. Now if we define lowercase k equals uppercase k over n and lowercase y equals uppercase y over n, we can arrive at this following equation lowercase y equals lowercase k to the power alpha. Using the production function and equation for lowercase y, we can find out the rental rate of capital.
and this rental rate of capital is equals to the marginal product of capital. So we can find out the marginal product of capital by taking the derivative of lowercase y with respect to lowercase k and then find this equation for marginal product of capital. So the total capital income per worker is the marginal product of capital times the capital that is used in production. So marginal product of capital times lowercase k, which is equal to alpha times k to the power alpha, which is equals alpha times y, because k to the power alpha is equals to lowercase y. Thus, a savings rate equals to alpha equates the consumption that is being given up to create capital with the income earned next period from that capital. So we are done with the lecture for today. The next chapter will tell you more about determination of output growth and steady state in the long run given a particular level of technological progress. Feel free to email me for any questions. Bye-bye.